So I'm going to be talking about Thailand. As Aroma Ravi also mentioned, Thailand has a national uh, slum upgrading program that's been um, talked about quite a bit. Um, as a middle income country, as an upper middle income country, uh, Thailand does perform better than a lot of other developing countries in terms of the scale of slums in the country. But some of the policies put in place that reflect uh, the intent to leave no one behind, make it worthy of a case study. Um, these are some of the main questions that we're looking to answer, similar to Peru, looking at what has been the nature of progress, <coughs> what are the factors both in terms of the design of Thailand's Ban Man Gong program and also wider political economy factors that have enabled this progress. Um, going forward, what are the challenges and what are some of the lessons that we can learn from Thailand's experience? Um, a little bit of background on the country, first in terms of the nature of the issue of slums and also in terms of some of the policies that have been in place in the past. Um, economic growth in Thailand has been fueled by labor um, intensive manufacturing, mainly around Bangkok because of which a lot of poor rural migrants from other parts of the country moved to Bangkok and uh, the surrounding provinces. I increased rural to urban migration contributed to increased pressure on housing and the expansion of slums in and around the Bangkok metropolitan region. Uh, by and large, in, in Thailand, slum dwellers haven't been squatters, but rather informally uh, rented land from either public or private landowners. And because of the informality of this um, renting, they've often not been allowed to build permanent um, housing structures, and also public authorities have not been um, inclined to provide them with access to basic services. Um, in terms of past efforts, since the, since the 1970s, there have been some small-scale slum upgrading programs across uh, the city, but these usually tended not to focus on uh, tenure issues, and by and large, slum dwellers had to relocate from their original places, often away from where their jobs were. Because of this, uh, these programs are not so successful and quite uh, fragmented. In 1990, there was a survey conducted by the National Housing Authority, which found that uh, fear of eviction and um, poor housing and environmental conditions were among the leading concerns of slum dwellers. And this led to a growing recognition that really um, the con living conditions of slum dwellers may not have improved uh, tangibly. And so um, following deliberations in 1992, the Urban Community Development Fund was set up with the Urban Community Development Office as an autonomous unit within the National Housing Authority. Um, the the office helped bring together communities and um, enable them to upgrade slums. But even then, often slum households had to relocate, and it was still project-based. Finally, in 2003, the Ban Man Gong program was initiated, which is what we'd be focusing on today. Um, looking at, first, we'll look at what progress has been achieved. As Paula mentioned, data has been an issue, and so we've had to rely on a range of quantitative and qualitative data from a variety of sources. Uh, overall, Thailand has made remarkable progress in terms of economic growth and poverty reduction as well, with the urban poverty rate coming down from nearly 40% in 1990 to less than 10% now. Um, while well-being is multidimensional, we focus again mainly on the physical living conditions of slum dwellers. Um, looking first in terms of tenure security, um, even in 1990, it appears from the data that uh, Thailand starts from a fairly high base with about 88% of urban households having secure tenure. However, this has increased even further to 95% by 2010, which is uh, impressive in the context of uh, the increasing urbanization with the share of urban population living um, with the share of population living in urban areas increasing from about thirty to forty five in this period and qualitative data also indicates progress although these surveys may not be strictly comparable, 
the fear of eviction dropped from second as in the list of concerns of slum dwellers to about fifth in 2006, which also reflects progress. In terms of housing conditions, um, the share of households living in housing structures made of durable materials, so either cement or brick or a combination of cement, brick, and wood, increased from about 66% to nearly 85%. Um, as part of the Ban Man Kong program, which is really a community-driven slum upgrading program across the nation, uh, set within settlements, um, communities often also identify weaker members, either the elderly, sometimes the disabled, who may not be able to upgrade and build community-funded uh, houses for them as well, so that they stay included in, in the community. In addition, uh, Funds are made available through the program to build um, community structures, whether it's meeting rooms, libraries, nurse, nurseries, that the whole community can benefit from and also often meet and come together to build, uh, build social cohesion as well. In terms of access to basic services, um, coverage was fairly high even in 1990 with um, about about 96% having access to improved water and 87% having improved sanitation. But these definitions of what is an improved um, service can be, can be, uh, can be uh, debated. Having said that, a lot of times, as I mentioned, because these um, slum settlements were informal, public authorities often uh, were reticent to provide basic services to them. Following Ban Man Kong, as they had official um, right over where they were staying, uh, households have been able to access formally and officially basic services, leading to reductions in their expenditure for water and electricity. Um, communities have also leveraged the funds available under the program to build um, permanent walkways between houses, uh, lighting in communal areas leading to greater safety and also um, community level drainage systems, septic tanks and wa um, water treatment systems. There have also been wider improvements in terms of both economic and non-economic uh, indicators with greater access to credit and lower debt from non-housing and business um, activities attributed in part to better financial management following participation in uh, community savings activities. Also, because they had formal tenure and therefore proof of address, a lot of um, employers require such proofs in order to provide formal sector employment, which um, some of these members of communities have been able to access. In terms of non-economic gains, Students have been found, uh, as per evaluations, to be spending more time studying or doing homework. Um, community funds have been used to invest in education. And by participating in community savings, as well as jointly planning and funding slum upgrading at the community level, it's improved social cohesion and trust between uh, community members. Finally, I think at the city level, there are networks in place, which I'll be discussing when I discuss uh, drivers of progress, that have brought together slum dwellers, and they're increasingly recognized as uh, legitimate members of, of the city, which is a more intangible but important indicator of progress. Looking at what, what seems to be driving this progress, I'll first look at factors within the design of Ban Man Kong, and then look at the broader context in which this has happened. The program has so far benefited uh, over 96,000 families across the country. Um, the cornerstone of the, of the program is that it's a community-driven program. Um, to start with, um, slum communities at the city level come together and survey all of the informal settlements in the city and prioritize which ones need to be upgraded based on the threat of eviction and, and needs of communities. Communities then need to uh, collectively save in order to qualify for loans under the program. Um, 
And I think one of the strengths of the program is that it has been very flexible. So communities ne uh, negotiate with the landowners in terms of whether they would be able to purchase the land collectively or get long rents. Um, also, they can, based on what works for them, either relocate or stay in the same place. So they have a lot of flexibility in design. Um, in terms of institutional and funding capacity, CODI, uh, which is the agency running the program, has, is an independent public organization and so has more flexibility compared to ministries. Um, as programs increased, also um, it was decentralized to the regional and city level and um, also involved community and NGO participation to link community uh, organizations at the city level. I think also economic growth has created the fiscal space for the government to invest in the program and also for households to invest in housing and repay loans. Finally, political commitment has been um, driving all of this, where since the early 2000s, there has been a push towards more pro-poor pro policies in terms of both having um, Ban Man Kong, but also universal health coverage and other such programs. Finally, what are the challenges? Um, preventing new slum formation has, has been, while um, upgrading of slums is important. There also needs to be sound urban planning to prevent more slums from forming, whereas this has been a reactive policy. It's also been found that reaching the poorest has been difficult, while Ban Man Gong requires communities to save in order to um, access finance. They, uh, this is difficult for many families. One of the strengths of Ban Man Kong, which is bringing together different actors, whether it's communities and the municipal government, also community architects and academics that provide technical assistance. This whole process is difficult, sometimes slow, and so limits the speed of change. Um, finally, the sustainability of Ban Man Kong going forward, given the political climate in Thailand, it entirely depends on what the political priorities would be going forward and some of the key lessons that we've um, found here are that progress is, is really rooted in putting communities at the center of upgrading and understanding what they want, also facilitating cooperation between different actors at the city level, whether it's experts, the government, or communities, and having flexibility in the arrangements between these different actors. Finally, we need preventive policies in place as well, and. Uh, reaching the poorest and leaving no one behind has been a challenge despite its inclusive design. That's Thank you very much indeed, Tanvi. Right, anybody want to offer a single quick David? Well, it was a great presentation. Hmm. Great presentation. Just talk anyway. <laughs> <laughs> great presentation. But let's just emphasize one amazing thing about Bad Man Car. National government funding trusted grassroots organizations within informal settlements and mm -hmm. gave support direct to them. And so all the negotiation, all the choice, and all the trade-offs were made by those community mm -hmm. organizations. You made these points, but I think we need to emphasize just how innovative it was in doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. I mean, for me, that's been a real hallmark of all of these case studies is the the kind of huge range of actors that have been involved and the fact that success has depended on all of those people working well together. But also, I think you're right to point out the sort of innovations. You know, this is a very specific and important case, but generally the kind of governance innovations that we're seeing in cities is a big part of the kind of dynamism and the, the excitement and I think the success in these cases and, um, and in some of the other, the ones that we're not talking about today, but hopefully we'll get to later on. Let me finally, last but not least, as they say, turn to, um, to Susan to talk about the India case study. Thank you. Which I understand is making quite a splash in India today. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Claire. Um, I guess I, w I wanted to say first a, a little bit about why Amenabad um, and, uh, and who was involved in putting together this case study. Um, my colleague at the end of the table, Tanvi, um, is, it was one of the key co-authors on this, so she deserves a lot of credit as well. Um, 
And in addition to the team here at ODI, we worked closely with um, the Urban Management Center, UMC, based in Ahmedabad, um, who provided contributions to this, as well as the Self-Employed Women's Association, SEVA, um, to help organize some focus groups. And, and I'll be talking some throughout um, in the presentation some more about SEVA, because they've actually been quite a key part of some of the progress that has been made. Um, it was quite an extensive um, piece of research. And it, we did, uh, in addition to a, a strong review of the literature, around 50 semi-structured interviews and, as I mentioned, a couple focus groups um, in some communities. Um, as we were looking at India and thinking about what aspect or where in India could we, we look at progress in, in urban conditions, um, Amenabag came out as in some of the initial appraisal as a place where the rural to urban transition um, was happening in uh, in a well managed way, um, meeting some of the needs of poor people. Um, there was a mitigation of urban sprawl um, through some of the planning uh, in in Amenabad, and an overall strengthening of basic services, particularly for the poor. Um, and so those were some of the initial reasons we thought this would be a really interesting case to look at. Um, just to situate Ahmedabad within India, it is the fifth largest um, city in India and had um, in, two, in 2011 6.3 million people. Um, India itself uh, has um, gone through a number of different phases in terms of, of urban development and um, treatment of uh, people from living in slums and, and the urban poor. Um, it, it, the first phase, kind of uh, at, at the dawn of, of independence, there was a strong focus on slum clearance um, and housing construction. That moved on uh, in the 70s and 80s to have a bit more balanced uh, focus on, on urban growth and, small and smaller urban centers, slum upgrading, um, into the, the 90s where um, liberalization and privatization and, and broader macroeconomic um, conditions have led to a focus on private sector participation in urban development. And now this has shifted more broadly to um, a, a phase with larger government programs, um, so an increasing investment in urban areas versus rural areas, um, and a movement towards smart cities. So in the context of, of those different phases, Amenabad has actually been at the forefront at, uh, of a lot of the, the developments and changes and been able to navigate um, some of these contexts um, in quite a, a smart way. Um, similar research questions as, as the other case studies, um, and so I, I won't mention those specifically, but jump to uh, what we are looking at. Um, the one thing that I should mention, um, in terms of Amenabad and how we framed um, the scope of the study, we actually decided to look um, at, at a bit more multi-dimensional progress, so not just the physical conditions um, of of the urban poor, but also looking across material well-being, environmental improvements, and political voice, because um, we thought there was quite an interesting story to tell across um, those sets of things. Um, there's similar issues in terms of data, uh, as, as with the other studies. And so there's some data that we're sharing here, but also some examples from specific programs and, and the data at the program level rather than the broader urban level that, that illustrate change. Um, in terms of material well-being and um, some of the elements that we were looking at, we looked across um, issues of, um, of income, um, of uh, access to finance, and living conditions. Um, so one of the things to emphasize is poverty rate in, in Gujarat declined um, at a, slight, a rate slightly ahead of the national average. Um, there was a, a whole um, transition period uh, as textile mills were closing, new industries coming up, and a movement um, or a greater reliance on informal employment over formal employment. 
Um, and so in that context, that has been very much um, a basis of livelihoods for, for many of the poor in Ahmedabad. But there's been a, a really impressive effort around collective organizing. And, and groups like the Self-Employed Women's Association, SEVA, have been key in that, um, both in terms of organizing to, um, for further uh, change, as well as um, developing things like the SEVA Bank and, and building access to finance. Um, the, the data that we found in terms of um, populations living in slums in Ahmedabad shifted quite substantially between 1991 when it was 26 percent to only 5 percent um, just a few years ago. So, so that is very impressive. Those specific numbers are contested by, by some different actors, but I mean, I, th I think from our qualitative research, we certainly found evidence that, that backs up this general trend. Um, the, there's been several elements of the, the living, condition, uh, living conditions that have been quite impressive around the slum networking project, which has been a really key element of the changes happening in Ahmedabad, have, has um, increased de facto tenure security and um, led to greater socioeconomic um, improvements. And then there's also been um, major movement around electrification. In terms of environment, some of the elements that we were looking at was managing um, of urban expansion. Um, and uh, really, Amenabad demonstrates a number of characteristics of smart growth in this sense. Proactive planning for urban expansion, um, compact urban areas uh, with lower sprawl um, based uh, on comparable cities. And the road network has been well planned with clear um, concentric ring roads and radials that start from the city center that, that facilitate movement that has been really important, particularly given some of the, the development of, of slums and, and upgrading and relocation of some of those. Um, there's also been a fair amount of progress in water supply and sanitation. So access to piped water in the home in slums um, increased from 1% in 2001 to 89% in um, 2011. So in just 10 years, um, huge, huge um, improvements there. And a similar level of improvement on sanitation in, in slum homes um, from 21%. Uh, 10 years ago to 87 percent um, just a few years ago. Um, these are figures based on um, communities that have been part of the slum networking project that, that um, in led to many of those improvements. Um, one of the things we should say as well, and I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more, is um, the Amenabad Municipal Corporation, um, gov which governs the city alongside the Amenabad Urban Development Authority, um, work really closely together um, along with um, some of the, the communities in um, leading to s these, these improvements. Um, finally, political voice. Um, there's been a huge uh, um, increase, so it's in, in some ways an increase and in some ways a transformation of the kind of collective action uh, that has happened over many years in Amenabad. I think it's, it's a place where that has had a vibrant civil society for, for quite a long time. And there's also been progress in terms of responsive um, local government that, that involves both uh, efforts around um, invited spaces for, um, for planning, um, as well as a rise in, in e-governance, which actually has brought some really interesting things to the city. So, what are some of the headlines in terms of how this progress has been driven? Um, some elements are actually quite similar to what you'll have heard in, in the other two case studies. Um, and there's a few things that maybe look a little bit different. Uh, one of the things that does look different is, is around um, strength in municipal governance and finance. Um, there was a major effort around prof professionalizing the administrative capacity in Amenabad um, and uh, some bold reforms that happened around tax inefficiencies leading to a uh, AA credit rating of the city. Um, and Amenabad was the first municipal body in Asia to issue a municipal bond. Um, and so that's allowed it to raise capital funds um, over uh, the last 10 to 15 years. Um, the first bond they raised uh, was worth um, 
US 26 million. Um, and so that has led to really healthy finances for the, the municipality. Um, the infrastructure development uh, that that has enabled them to do has led to a number of programs um, in, in that um, are detailed in the case study, um, but really interesting approaches like something called the 80-20 toilet scheme, which um, was an 80% investment from the municipality and a 20% investment from um, participating households to, to set up toilets. Um, there's a, a real thread of collaboration um, across all of these programs between the municipal government and, uh, and slum communities. Um, there's also, uh, whoops, in terms of um, investing in infrastructure development, um, the, uh, sorry, I, I just mentioned infrastructure development. Um, on planning for urban expansion, the one thing I wanted to mention on that is a strong partnership between efforts of citywide development plans and then a more granular town planning scheme that has made a real difference. Um, and 89% of the, de the city's development plan um, can be considered to have been implemented, which is quite different from what you'll find in other cities um, across India. Um, and then finally, this, this point about community mobilization and joint partnerships. And I don't think we can stress that enough um, as having been a major driver behind the progress that has been seen. In terms of challenges, um, the, there, there has been really differing views about the challenges um, within Amenabad. Has this been a story of progress? Um, yes, I think that there has been fairly good consensus on. Is it continuing to be a story of progress, and particularly when one looks at it from an inclusive lens? Um, there are more questions on that. And the challenges that, that we've detailed here around inequities, um, an increasing centralized approach to implementing urban policy, um, some of the increasing social tensions that have happened um, uh, that kind of the city has been a, a flashpoint around and the, the um, risks around um, environmental impact as the, the population grows. Some of those are, are challenges that certainly were raised as a part of our, our interview process and um, through focus groups. So headlines on, um, on lessons learned. Again, uh, some very similar things uh, that, you, that we'll have seen across the other case studies. Um, this, the, the, maybe one thing I didn't mention that has been key in Ahmedabad has been the extension of public services in slum communities regardless of land tenure. Um, and so there has been a, a kind of no objection certificate uh, given to households that have allowed them to have that um, access to, to services. Civil society, again, has, has been huge in mediate and um, played a mediating role between communities and government. Um, there's been strong incentives for partnerships. Um, both uh, with communities but across government departments as, as well. Um, there's been leverage of limited public funds um, to acquire alternative financing. I mentioned the municipal bond already. Um, but the, the biggest um, risk or concern that we heard from, from people within Ahmedabad was concerns about how this um, very uh, participatory approach to urban development, how that um, can continue to be a feature as more and more money is coming into um, with large urban projects, including for the poor. Um, and, and that is an issue as, as um, the city continues to develop. Thank you very much indeed, Susan. Um, in lieu of an expert comment this time, let me just offer a thought from um, Mike Pusty from World Vision in Melbourne, Australia, just to prove how global we are, um, who asks, um, I think, an interesting question for us to think about in the next session, to think about whether within these various common factors that we've been talking about that have driven this progress, um, is there any hierarchy? Are there any of these factors which are more important than others? Are there some which are the sort of necessary condition for progress and others which are, are kind of help things along but aren't absolutely vital? So I think that's something we can, um, we can think about for the next session. Let me thank all of our speakers.
And say that uh, as your reward for sitting and listening for so long, we're now offering you some more coffee outside. We're going to come back, uh, especially for you, so I've just sat down. <laughs> and uh, and um, if we can ask you all please to come back in 10 minutes where we'll get into a panel conversation. Apologies, I wasn't able to come to you for your question, but if you hold that thought for, uh, for the next session, I'll ask you first. Thank you very much. Please go and help yourselves to more coffee.